In Seminar 14, Jacques Lacan raises the question of what sex is and how it is there is no such thing as a sexual relationship, over and over. It is difficult to know exactly what he means, particularly when he connects this issue to what he calls his slide rule analogy, a demonstration of how the little a, the oje petita, relates to the big A, the autre, by means of the Fibonacci series, as it relates mathematically to the unary trait, a complication in its own right. My approach has been to develop a workaround using six new critical terms relating to optics and visual experience, four of which are shown here. These derive from the figure ground distinctions, something most architects and artists will know something about. But in light of projective geometry, these terms are charged with new meanings that fortunately shed light on previously mysterious ethnographic issues. In this video, I skip the ethnography for the most part and try to get a better start with the slide rule analogy. If anything is impossible besides the sexual relationship, it is the difficult time most people have in understanding what Lacan means when he says that 1 plus a equals 1 over a, or how he could possibly make this a key to sexuality. This lecture presumes a little knowledge about projective geometry and the theorems of Girard de Sargue. There are some previous videos on these subjects if you need a refresher. Let's begin with a straight line and mark off an interval of it, and set it equal to 1. Lacan early on equates the 1 with the big other, the autre, but for now we'll leave it at the numeric 1, with the understanding that later on this will connect to the idea of the unary trait, which Lacan is already related to the Fibonacci number series 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and so on, and will later reinforce this idea in other seminars, notably Seminar 17, The Other Side of Psychoanalysis. At the left side of the interval of 1, let's suppose we can find a point that would represent the golden ratio between the new distance and the 1. We can mark off this distance both inside and outside the interval of the 1. The blue and pink shading is set equal to the Fibonacci ratio. We have Lacan's formula, 1 plus a over 1 equals 1 over a. How does he get this? We can see right away that in the pink area on the right, a subtracted from 1 will be 1 minus a. Let's do a little algebra. If we cross multiply Lacan's equation, we will get a plus a squared equal to 1. If we subtract a from both sides, we see that a squared is equal to a minus 1. But this is also the interval left over after subtracting the little a in the blue zone from 1, the pink area interval, 1 minus a. We have a ready-made answer now for a square, which is that it is equal to 1 minus a. Now, if every blue zone is related to a pink zone by a squaring operation, we can extend this inside the interval of the 1. Thanks to this visual association, the algebra extends to a quick means of deepening the interior of the 1 interval through powers of A. Another funny thing happens. The pink on the right side produces an even power of A to the 2 power. The next time we perform this operation, we will get an odd power, a to the 3, or a cubed, but it will be on the left. The left-right pattern continues, because every time we increase, or rather decrease the intervals, this is because the a is less than 1, so powers of a will all decrease, we must flip the blue-pink ruler that always shows what the golden ratio will be.
Is this what Lacan meant when he said that there is no sexual relationship? Is it drawn from the fact that the golden ratio is never a real number, but always a relationship or ratio that's up in the air, a dynamic oscillation between the previous and the next value? Lacan makes a big deal about how the one will end up at the vanishing point on what he calls the horizon of sex. But because this is a horizon, we know it will be circular and that the vanishing point will be a gap where the circulation takes place, not a fixed point. In all other cases with gap circles of this kind, we find the little a, the auger petit a, in the gap. Does this mean that, paradoxically, the a and the one are equal? Or is it the more provocative possibility that the infinity sign is literally a circuit that engages two commodities in a golden manner, so that the fact that they never touch means that they perpetually circulate, creating not just one circuit, but two? This double circuit idea is certainly intriguing, because we find it in other places when we look at the Fibonacci numbers in relation to the unary trait and the slide rule behavior of the little a and big A. If we duplicate the number series, we find we can do it in terms of odds and evens that Lacan's slide rule shows as powers of A. Jogging the number series across each other both preserves the ratio of ones, one, one, two, two, three, three, etc., but on a diagonal basis. Vertically, we get successively better approximations of the value of phi in both the version that is greater than one and the version that is less than one. One plus or minus a means that little a is a circuit that creates in alternation a positive and negative charge. We should formalize this issue one step further. If we are looking at something with a left-right order, it means that we are looking at something face-to-face, -face, since our own stereognostic visuality is mirrored by the object we are inspecting. Applying the general rule that the viewer and the viewed are separated by a cut in the same way that the knower and the known are separated, we now have the extra information that we are looking at a kind of facade but the sideways structure of the image means that we are looking at what in architecture drawing is called a section view. The cut is not the same as a transparent window pane we look through to see the landscape lying beyond. The world outside doesn't have a left or right. Only other chiralistic subjects do. And when we look at them, their right and left are reversed from ours. Here, we are looking into a left-right-left shifting field that imitates a perspective tunnel, with powers of A increasing, or rather shrinking, the space in imitation of a distance stretching to infinity. At the vanishing point will be a 1 or a little A. We can't say for sure. All we know is that the depth simulated by the increasing powers of A will be chiralistic, unary, and golden, even though at this point we have no idea what this might mean. When in doubt, such as is the case now, we need an ersatz move that expects to fail. But to compensate for our failure, we will get error data that can be used productively to stage our next move. If, as Lacan says, the vanishing point is the perfect one that is the vanishing point lying on the horizon at infinity, and at the same time we know that this point is on the plane of left-right-left movements inside the interval of the one, we have to consider that this is nothing less than a stereogram, a kind of moiré that we obtained by getting our eyes to simulate a patterned field folding across itself. If you have ever played with a stereogram, you will know that it creates a vanishing point and parallax that's not in the far distance, but as close as a surface 
the pattern is printed on. This is a local infinity, which is cut out from the Euclidean space that surrounds it. If you're good at this, you'll be able to see a snake dressed in paisley in a space inserted inside our usual perspectival space. The loss of regular parallax by focusing on distant infinity is compensated by a local parallax that allows the background to shift if you move your head. If perspective could be likened to a circle, then the stereogram takes up the part of the little a, the oje petita, in that it is a gap, a cut surrounded by something that would seem to make it impossible and want to fill it in in a more ordinary way. The stereogram resists this by being a pure case of repetition, in that it will always return our eyes to the same impossible image. The stereogram's toroidal aspect is the way it simulates the effects of the pure projective plane, which must be folded over itself in an impossible way to produce such forms as the Klein bottle, the Mobius band, and the torus. Earlier in Seminar 14, Lacan used a logical square that began as an Aristotelian knockoff, but then clearly took on the identity of what is called the standard polygon, a notational convention for representing projective forms. Lacan left no doubt that he wished to convert the Aristotelian oppositions to topological ones, especially when he referred to the symbolic as limited at a kind of equator where the psychosis of being outside the symbolic in the passage à l'acte held a corner opposite to the acting out position inside the symbolic. When the arrows converge on the lower left corner, they identify what is more of a cross-cap situation than a toroidal closure. Lacan labels this corner both as alienation and sublimation, and in both cases we have a combination of continents and incontinents that can only be represented by a cross cap. The Lacanian Dan Collins has said that, and I'm paraphrasing here, that the cross cap is what the torus wants to be when it grows up, and I agree that the torus concludes its circling spiral to show how insulation works. This is great news for architects, whose business it is to know all about insulation. The cross cap is both dynamic and static. Its lower part is a bowl-like container, like the tube of the torus, but its upper portion is more explicit about incontinence in that it shows a single surface that circulates its interior and exterior in alternation. You have a circuit, but instead of plus and minus, you have an inside and outside, a prison without any doors, a trap without any locks or tricks, just the effect of self-paralysis. I wish I could explain this simply. Lacan gives us a one that is both itself and not itself. It's a fixed point, yet a vanishing point, and it's a perpetual figure eight that circulates opposed energies. It makes the perfect death drive because you get both the impulse for self-destruction and the desire to live in a timeless nirvana. In comparison to the paradox of there being no sexual relationship, I think we have a more cosmic problem on our hands, a problem of subjectivity itself as both self-preserving and self-destructive. Possibly, we should stop whinging about not having a sexual relationship and look for the nearest bomb shelter. But of course any bomb shelter we might think to be safe will have just another version of the cut built in, because it will be our desire to escape that will carry with it the fate from which we are trying to flee. This is a kind of perpetual motion machine, and it begins with the symbolic itself. Dan Collins has pointed to the primal distinction between vowels and consonants on the level of phonology. I would move to the level of semiology and make the same contrast between metaphor and metonymy. Roughly, 
These follow the dream functions of condensation and displacement. Metaphor replaces a signifier with another signifier. Metonymy links signifiers in a chain. By using, by using the material and signified and signifier functions alternately. Just as we flipped our golden rule each time we wanted to generate a new power of A. The result of suppression is the creation of signifying chains, where the indication of any stable signifier is replaced by a distancing function, an X that continuously postpones the discovery of the signified. In this motion, the signifier imitates the interior 8 or infinity function, introducing a localized depth parallax that one could compare to the effect of the story inside the story. Signifying chains are another way of saying that psyche extends itself so that it can tell stories about itself later. Extension, metonymy, is catagraphic. This means that as psyche moves into a space, it defines the space it moves into. If this isn't chicken and egg enough for you, consider how ethnography continually gives us concrete examples of the impossible real that we find difficult to diagram through math themes or through the pathology of the neurotic unconscious. When something defies knowledge, ethnology gives us a character who defies knowledge and shows us how he or she relates to other characters. This makes it easier to map the shifts in dimensions and topologies. All we have to do is wait to get to the end of the story. For the wild man, we know that he has come to get the king, a kind of retributive force of nature that limits those with excessive ambitions and large bank accounts. The fact that the wild man is also figured as a green man points us to the fact that the fool is cyclical, that the cycle of folly is just as figure 80 as the cross cap and just as locally infinite. When the wild man is brought into sophisticated artworks, such as Mozart's Die Zauberflöte, the magic flute, Mozart has brought key details about the wild man into focus. As the title suggests, this is the idea of an instrument or tool that works on its own and does not require any input. The magic flute and magic bells of this opera work like apotropes, devices to deflect danger, and catagraphic cuts, marks to restrict the movement of evil rivals. In the case of this opera, the sound of the magic bells paralyzes the villain, Monostatos, whose very name tells us that Mozart knows a thing or two about the catagraphic mark and the involvement of the magic automaton. Magical automation, which is the same as the repetition at the upper corner of Lacan's toroid diagram, as that diagram requires, divides into two zones. Outside the symbolic is the wild man, Papageno, whose sexual proclivity is released once he finds his perfect mate, Papagena. Inside the symbolic, the proper hero, Tamino, must act out by undertaking a descent into the underworld, a catabasis. These two versions of repetition then contract on the far corner of the Taurus polygon, where there is a cross-cap conclusion. Containment is achieved by Tamino and Tamina's succession to the kingdom. Incontinence is the job of Pamino and Tamino, as they reproduce without any apparent limit, social or natural. The story of the magic flute is ancient, much older than Mozart's 1791 opera. It is the story of the king as a double, with a dead shadow protecting him from a 180-degree position outside the symbolic. The rotation of the two kings is an example of how psyche extends itself, in a circular or spiral way, to be precise. We don't have to look far. All of the famous folklorists and mythographers come to the same conclusion. The hero is synonymous with a circle of the journey out and back. And from the famous circles, such as Odysseus's return to Ithaca, 
we know that there is going to be a fight around the issue of misrecognition. Do we have a way of modeling this common folk motif? Let's postpone this question to consider a way of looking at the function of shadows in the most analytical way possible. Why analytical? Because shadows are probably the most versatile and common element in early cultures' artistic and poetic traditions. It would be impossible to work by generalizing about details. Rather, we have to begin with what should a shadow be approach and see how the structure of an everyday phenomenon might have some internal structure that allows it to play an uncanny role at all stages of culture, in every different culture. For the subjective physics of the shadow, we could do no better than de Sargue's theorem about what happens when we look at things that block our view of what lies behind. Out of this primitive universal condition, there is a spooky rule that seems to come out of nowhere. If we use three lines radiating from the eye, to represent the cone of vision, we would find that any two triangles whose corners touch those lines will have sides that extend to converge along a single line. The fact that the shadow has an implicit geometric order to it would seem to lay the foundation for folk beliefs that the shadow has a life of its own, that it looks back at us just as we look at it, and our two gazes meet up at the profile around any visible object. I found some terms that describe what happens at the silhouette, but I won't go into them in detail here. Basically, they describe how, when we distinguish between a figure and ground, we create something like a stereographic middle space, something cut out of and not belonging to Euclidean space in general. This is the reason that all cultures seem to regard shadows as reservoirs of magical powers and strive to protect their shadows as much as they protect their actual bodies. Desargues' theorem predicts that the invisible shadow of our own visual extension into the world has a rebound effect that meets up with the profile of the visible object in our specular field. This creates a catagraphic cut of the figure from the ground not just a simple cutout. The profile is therefore isomeric, or defined from two sides, although it is only visibility that has created it. The one had generated a double. The most familiar aspect of this shadow power is the evil eye, which watches us from a concealed position and regulates our desire by leveling down good luck but also building up a recovery from bad luck. Our mortal eye is connected to an immortal, infinite eye lying at the horizon of all possible visibility. If you know anything about the evil eye, you may be able to understand the meaning of some of the technical terms I use to describe figure ground behavior. The line connecting the two eyes is called cathesis. As with the usual vanishing point of Euclidean perspective, cathesis comes with parallax. But as we saw with a stereogram, it's a space in the middle of space, not perspectival parallax. Still, cathetic parallax gives us some idea about how our beliefs and behaviors concerning shadows and profiles work like a homeostasis mechanism, set in place to even out the vicissitudes of good and evil, bad luck and good luck, and ultimately life and death. The balance of payment, so to speak, takes place at the profile as an isomeric exchange. Whatever is able to reset the balance of scales holding visibility and invisibility. These terms are useful in translating what happens in ethnography and cultural practices, where the uncanny and anamorphosis abound. But because the profile around the visible object is the site of a suppression of both a semantic and optical type, the eclipse of the invisible by the visible sets up an exchange economy that, like suppression in general, allows the human subject to absorb the traumatic events of the real while preserving the fantasy structure of the symbolic. This is Lacan speak for saying that isomerics 
is like a shock absorber, preventing damage to the delicate mechanisms we use to think about the everyday in an everyday manner, that is, neurotically. There's a lot more to say about the perfect shadow, but the one important thing to remember is that it's perfect. Because the catagraphic cut defines the material strata it cuts into, it will be able to handle most stresses and strains. Only when trauma overwhelms it will it be forced to give into the shadow and its storehouse of monsters. At that point, demons will storm the gates and nothing can hold them back. But thankfully, there are even ways of responding to such attacks. More about that later.